Let me welcome all of you uh, to this important webinar tonight, um, uh, in which we are going to have some of the most uh, distinguished voices that could be gathered together uh, to speak about it, recent events in Belarus. Um, uh, the International uh, Committee, um, uh, which I've had the privilege of chairing, which has been dealing with events in Belarus and of course for over a year now, um, has, uh, has met at, at regular intervals to do a survey of the situation. None of us would have imagined that we would be seeing what took place only a few weeks ago, which was the forced landing of uh, an airplane at Linsk uh, airport. Um, it was a flight that was bound for Vilnius, um, uh, uh, the capital of Lithuania from uh, uh, Greece. So be, be flying between two European Union countries and uh, with the claim that there was a bomb on board, um, the plane was intercepted, forced to make a landing in Minsk um, and, uh, uh, and in, indeed in, in forcing it down, um, military planes were involved. So putting a fear that if they didn't come down voluntarily that there might be um, uh, force uh, applied. Um, and of course, as it turned out, no evidence of any bomb on that flight at all, um, but the arrest of a leading opposition uh, journalist and spokesperson um, and his partner, and both of whom have been held in custody and who um, have, uh, um, made statements publicly um, implicating themselves um, in um, uh, criminal activity um, of opposition to the government and so forth, um, where it looks very much as though they may have been coerced, uh, seriously coerced into making those statements. So with me tonight, as I've said, I have a very, very distinguished panel. Um, uh, time is of the essence. I'm going to tell them all that I'm asking them to be very strict about their timing. Um, to stick to um, 10 minutes, maybe at maximum 15, but I'm hoping that you'll stay inside that um, 10 to 15 minutes. And um, I'm going to start off um, with Professor Max Duplessis, who is a senior counsel. Um, and I'm going to ask you, Max, to set the scene um, and to give us the legal framework, because this was an outrage um, in terms of, of many elements of law. So please, um, Set, set the stage. Thank you very much. Um, and I do intend to speak about it as an outrage. What we've witnessed over the past weeks is outrage at the acts by Belarus, which are a step too far in my view. They're certainly a step too far for international law in the sense that President Lukashenko's regime wildly overstepped the mark of what international law permits and did so apparently in multiple respects. But now the question is, what can international law do about it? While the reasons for the diversion of the Ryanair jet is under investigation, already forceful reactions abound. A range of commentators, governments, and institutions have alleged international law violations. We've heard claims ranging from abduction, air piracy, torture, as well as possible crimes, all of which has been done in denouncing Belarus's actions against Roman Protasevich and his girlfriend, Sofia Sapiga. And few appear willing to accept the move by Lukashenko's regime to have placed Roman Protasevich on a list of individuals involved in terrorist activities. Others on this panel, I'm sure, will speak on violations under aviation laws, piracy laws, and other international treaties. And each of these violations are concerning, as I'm sure the other speakers will highlight. But there is a broader contextual question in which I plan to focus on. Zooming out from the facts to see the broader landscape, I think we can appreciate there's something systematic and widespread going on. And once we do that, we can think more carefully about the promises and problems of international accountability for those who were involved. And I think here we must be strategic in doing so, given that it's not surprising that President Lukashenko has not signed up to any international justice mechanisms that allow for direct accountability. So let's start with the crimes. They entail, as is well known, the suppression of dissent. But it's not just any suppression. It's widespread in Belarus, and it appears to be a frontal abuse directed against a civilian population in a country run by Europe's longest running ruler, who has now been in power for some 27 years, the same time, incidentally, that Nelson Mandela, also labeled as a terrorist by an autocratic regime, was kept in prison. 
And importantly, as a report from Chatham House has recently explained, one might start thinking about the suppression in the parlance of the International Criminal Court. And according to the Rome Statute, the court's founding treaty, crimes against humanity include widespread or systematic abuses directed against a civilian population. Mm. And here, currently, evidence is being gathered of the crimes within and outside Belarus. We know of reports about the United Nations Human Rights Office's fact-finding mission on Belarus, having appointed three high-level experts to assist in such an investigation, and reports also of the Council of Europe's Committee on Legal Affairs having begun to gather information. And here, I think we need to just pause to reflect that these atrocities relevant to Belarus appear to include arbitrary imprisonment, torture, inhuman treatment, sexual violence, and enforced disappearances. But these are acts that are listed as predicate crimes against humanity under Article 7 of the ICC statute. And here, importantly, what is more, it's the context of their commission. These crimes are not committed randomly, but rather as a pattern, as a pattern of politically motivated state violence against opposition members and their support, supporters. And importantly, given that they've been perpetrated on political grounds and involve the severe deprivation of the fundamental rights of their victims, there's at least an argument that these crimes could further amount to the crime against humanity of persecution under the statute. And due to seemingly continued absence of any form of domestic criminal proceedings against those potentially responsible for the crimes, we then have impunity. And in the light of the gravity of the acts committed, there's then an argument that the crimes may well meet the requisite jurisdictional thresholds as ICC crimes. So it's within that context that a young man and his partner are abducted in midair and then extraordinarily rendered to the regime's authority because of his dissident views. And the crimes against them are not isolated. In other words, they're taking part within the context of a broader pattern of alleged criminality within Belarus. But of course, and he has the point I want to stress, it's much more than that. It's far more than just Belarus. The crimes have now been internationalized, I would say, in three ways. And that's what I'd like to stress. Let me start with the first internationalizing feature. And that is the mounting evidence in our world of transnational suppression. We're witnessing the rise of transnational bullying and terrorization. Diverting a civilian airline, forcing it to land, all of it to enforce suppression of dissent. Well, this is, as one commentator has rightly stressed, merely the representation of the latest event in a dangerous pattern. And we can list here a number of acts of transnational repression, perhaps the most notor notorious being the brutal murder of the journalist Jamal Khashoggi at the Saudi consulate in Istanbul in October 2018. A recent report by Freedom House in the US has worryingly catalogued that there have been 608 instances of transnational repression since 2014. And it points out what should by now be obvious to all of us. What appear to be isolated incidents when viewed separately, an assassination here, a kidnapping there, in fact form a constant threat across the world and it's changing how activists, journalists, and regular individuals go about their lives. Transnational repression then is the first internationalizing aspect I want to highlight. It's no longer an exceptional tool. It's a normal and institutionalized practice for dozens of countries that seek to control their citizens abroad. And this incident by President Lukashenko and his agents demonstrates just how serious the threat is and the international community's response is critically important to arrest the mounting and transnational rampage of oppression. These incidents are increasing precisely because they've to date been met largely with impunity. That cannot be allowed to continue, particularly so because of the second internationalizing feature of this incident that I want to stress. And that is that these crimes are not ordinary crimes. They are so systematic, widespread, and sickeningly terrorizing of their civilian targets that they give rise to the portent of crimes against humanity. And given their context and nature, as I previously highlighted, the crimes exemplified in the kidnapping of Protasevich and Sapiga are thus of concern to all humanity. The perpetrators are hostes humani generis, enemies of all humankind. And then finally, there's the third of the internationalizing elements that I want to stress. And that is that it appears that Putin's playbook is Lukashenko's playbook. We've all witnessed the support and the cover provided to the Belarusian president by Russia in the saga and before. And there are the allegations that KGB agents were aboard the plane. And that allows us to be sober and strategic about any international criminal law response. While there's been talk about recourse to the ICC, we know that Belarus is not a party to the Rome Statute of the ICC, and so the only way to trigger the court's jurisdiction would be a referral by the United Nations Security Council, 
But here too, we know that Russia will undoubtedly veto any referral. But then in another sense, Russia's cold stonewalling and the by now depressing rail politic that bedevils the work of the Security Council should, I think, reinvigorate us. It should reinvigorate rule of loving nations and their people. Let me conclude then on this point. I don't think that Belarus and its Russian protector should be an excuse for impunity. That's all the more so because of the first two internationalizing features of this incident that I mentioned. Firstly, as I said, the drama underlines that we shouldn't underestimate the risk to our own territories and airspaces of transnational repression. And secondly, I stressed that we should relatedly and repeatedly remind ourselves that these are no ordinary crimes that are of such a grave nature and proclivity as to demand a universal response. So while Moscow may in the short time stymie the ICC's involvement, that just means we have to redouble our efforts to use other avenues for accountability. And while the creation of international criminal courts provides one path for punishing such crimes, a different path focuses on harnessing national institutions towards that end. The ICC does not exercise universal jurisdiction, but importantly here, states do. And it's here that the real potential lies for states working together to make the world a smaller place for those who commit these types of crimes. I don't have the time to go into all of them, including the use of Magnitsky type laws to impose sanctions. But it's important to stress the news that the European Parliament, in collaboration with other international stakeholders, is apparently in the midst of setting up the Belarus accountability platform, which perhaps we'll hear about more from others. And this international advisory platform is tasked with gathering evidence of serious human rights violations in Belarus, assessing it, and all with the aim of making that information available to member states for the purposes of exercising their universal jurisdiction to bring about prosecutions. And so what I want to end with is the embracing and overlapping potential of universal jurisdiction laws being put to use in this context. Fortunately, we have ready examples. One is in respect of Syria. Just over a year ago, on the 23rd of April, 2020, German prosecutors commenced a landmark case against two former Syrian intelligence officers on charges of crimes against humanity. The case resulted from a joint effort of French and German authorities, assisted by the cooperation of Syrian lawyers and NGOs and the families of victims, many of which provided important evidence for the trial. And here, the good news is that the German court last year convicted a Syrian intelligence officer, Eyad al-Kharib, after German prosecutors successfully argued that al-Kharib had helped to arrest protesters in 2011 who were later tortured and murdered. Does it sound familiar? Well, in this regard, we should then herald the news of last week that 10 Belarusians have asked Germany's federal prosecutor to open a criminal investigation against President Lukashenko and Belarusian security officers for alleged crimes against humanity during a crackdown on the anti-government protests last year. Lawyers who brought the case for the 10 people who are now living across Europe cited these very universal jurisdiction laws. And reports indicate that their focus in that case is on more than 100 examples of systematic torture and violence and other abuses during the government's crackdown in 2020 on protests. But my closing point is this, I would go further. The prosecutors should be encouraged to include an investigation now into the facts of what's happened with Protasevich and Sapiga because their kidnapping and the ongoing detention that they face are part of the same pattern of violence and oppression that flows from happen what happened already last year and which is under investigation. Their plight, I think, is the latest and most high profile example of the same contextual crimes in Belarus. And you can be sure that as major powers and prosecutors consider their responses to Lukashenko's outrages, autocrats and other dictators will also be watching carefully. Without immediate and deliberate action against Lukashenko's regime, they will interpret this as another blank check to terrorize their mm. citizens, mm. increasingly in our cities and aboard our aircraft. But if the German prosecutors and prosecutors in other like-minded states were publicly to open an investigation into the kidnapping and ongoing detention of Protasevich and Sapiga, they will help to achieve a fundamental goal. They will allow their captives to know that the world is watching, and it's watching with universal eyes and with universal courts, ready to hold violators to account, because what happens to Protasevich and Sapiga is felt as a crime against all of us. Mm. Thank you. Max, that was that was really, really wonderful. It was a, a really uh, great review of the situation, but also mm. 
um, really a kind of uh, encouragement for us to be much more creative in dealing with this. I always remember in the uh, late 90s when uh, uh, a warrant was issued for Pinochet, I had this great sort of upsurge of hope um, that uh, tyrants would not be able to travel and that they would fear um, for their lives if they uh, if they went abroad, and uh, and uh, unfortunately that sort of withered a bit on the vine as the, as we entered the twenty first century. But I think we have to revitalise it, as you've said, and uh, reimagine ways in which we can be using this law. So I, I really want to thank you for that great opening. Um, I'm now going to turn to um, um, our next speaker, and. Uh, he is uh, um, our, our ambassador, our former ambassador, His Excellency uh, François Zineré. Uh, uh, François, um, encouraged by that and by, by Max's uh, um, overview, um, is, first of all, take us down the road of what this means in terms of breaches of what the standards would be in terms of international diplomacy and so on, and how our governments ought to be responding to this. First, thank you very much for having invited me and for, thank you for this initiative. I'm very glad as a member of the French uh, team of um, uh, the artist Street to participate to this uh, timely event. And I think, uh, Mrs. Baroness, that you, you had the, mentioned a word which I think is key in this case, which is creativity. Why creativity mm -hmm. is needed because we see a kind of abutment. We see, uh, I don't know if abutment is a good word, ab abutting, it's, we see that all the tools we have already mentioned, even though we have a very uh, creative and audacious uh, presentation <coughs> from Max, uh, which is with very, very interesting avenues and that, that definitely deserves to be explored uh, in depth. Um, we could see uh, on, with a distant look of the long histoire, the long history, that uh, we have to admit that uh, all the tools we have in hand have not been effective uh, with some countries, especially with Belarus and Follow. And we have to always reassess the effectivity of our tools. So in terms of creativity first, just one word on that and the legal creativity which is always needed i think that's a, a crime against humanity of course it's a very powerful tool of course i was just thinking loudly on the another possibility you know that uh, hijacking a plane in france and i probably in many other countries is a crime and when a crime is committed against a, a french citizen uh, french jurisdictions are competent so it would be mm. interesting to check the passenger list. Yes, yes. Uh, uh, it was just a remark. Uh, uh, it, it would be very, maybe we would be inspired by checking the passenger list as well. And of course, there is probably many things to do, uh, not only on the field of political crime, but also on the field of putting um, all the airspace navigation in danger. Because if someone cry, uh, start to cry wolf, you say like that in English, cry wolf, uh, no one will uh, anymore, be, we, we will put in doubt any kind of um, tomorrow real terror uh, bomb threat on, on planes. And uh, maybe it would not be um, believed and it could be, lead to an accident or a, a, a dramatic uh, end. Uh, with a more diplomatic and political um, look, I checked before our, our talk, I checked uh, the amount of exchanges and trade with uh, Belarus. And I was surprised, uh, very surprised, I'm not surprised, but I, I, I was impressed, let's say, by uh, how weak our, our uh, um, um, uh, economic uh, relation. Uh, not only France, but uh, all the countries of the, the developed countries, especially Europe, UK, we have very little exchanges with Belarus. And of course, this is the result of their policy of uh, isolation, they are turned toward uh, Russia. It's also unfortunately the result of our policy of sanctions, which is absolutely uh, legitimate. And I think on the short term, 
we have to maintain the highest pressure. And for once, uh, I think that the reaction of the of EU has been prompt. I denounced when I was a member of the European Parliament, and especially dealing with human rights, I have denounced many times uh, the, um, how EU was reluctant to, uh, to, to take the legitimate appropriate steps. But this time it has been swift. Why? Because I think that we have all observed in our uh, lives of uh, human rights activists or lawyers that there are cases that there is no link between the political reaction and how severe can be a case, a violation. We all have in mind extremely severe violations, serious violations with very low or inexistent political reaction. Uh, for once, I think that, and I think uh, Max Duplessis was very right, mentioning all the cases, and especially uh, Khashoggi case in Saudi Arabia, uh, Protasevich is becoming a symbol. And not only, the, because everyone could identify uh, with him as a person, his parents, and on, uh, with a political look, I would say that his public confession was extremely awkward from the regime uh, because the mobilization will, will, will be extremely growing. And it's also the symbol of the weakness of the regime because they have sent, uh, one should realize that they have sent uh, uh, an air, um, how do you say, a war plane to stop this teenager. Uh, what is it if not an evidence, a proof of the extreme weakness of the regime? But I come, come back to the thread of my reflection. So we are in a case where it's not only a serious violation, it be, it's becoming and it has to become a symbol. This is why it has led to a prompt and for once swift political reaction and sanctions. The amount of uh, um, aid that was programmed, scheduled and has been freezed, frozen by, uh, uh, by EU is $3 billion, 3 billion euros, I think which is quite significant uh, for a country of a uh, little more than 9 million uh, inhabitants. So I think at, at the short term, there is no alternative. But the question I ask to myself, thinking loudly, is it efficient on the long term? We also, uh, having observed that we have a very low um, flow of exchanges, economic trade exchanges between us. The consequence is that we have a very, uh, very low, very small leverage effect. So we deprive ourselves of the possibility of leverage. So I think that we have to refine our uh, diplomatic and economic response by targeting uh, very severely the persons and trying to develop the relationship with the country. Because that's the only way, I think, to create uh, interdependence, interdependence, and to create for us a leverage, especially for human rights. I know it's a very delicate uh, couple. If we create uh, interdependence, if we encourage exchanges, economic trade, of course, we will be accused to uh, turn the eyes from uh, the violations of human rights and uh, to renounce to the sanctions, to be weak and uh, to show cowardness. And I understand that. I have often said that. But I think that there is a conflict in temporalities, short term against long term. The short term, we, we should hit 
and they should feel the consequence. When I say hit, it's not militarily, of course, but we, they should feel. And I encourage all kind of legal creativity. I encourage uh, battles of on all fronts, and I encourage the everything that could uh, uh, stick the name of Protasevich to the name of this regime, as it was with Kasogi and uh, MBS. Uh, but on the long, on the long uh, term perspective, one should have a vision, and this vision should not to uh, cannot be on the long run to um, diminish, diminish, and diminish again the flow of exchanges. Because at the end of the day, we will uh, offer Belarus, uh, uh, we will push Belarus more in the hands of Russia. And this is not the interest of, uh, of mm. it's mm. not our interest, and it's not the interest of human rights. Sorry That's, for my English, which is not as good no. as I would like it to be, but. Uh... Your English is delicious, actually. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. Um, that's a very, very interesting thing that you've just said um, about diminishing, by diminishing uh, um, our contact, we may push people into um, mm. the arms of others. Um, it's something that I've been saying recently about uh, uh, the issue of China um, mm. with its new Belt and Road policy, which is that, you know, the West should have been stepping up to the plate and dealing with uh, the needs of uh, the developing world and with Africa and so on and instead um, didn't do that and of course created opportunities for China to, to actually uh, take, take uh, the place of the West in. And so we now have this great problem of huge influence in our international organizations and institutions. And we, we failed, um, the West failed. So um, the, uh, you've presented us with a challenge, which is how do we keep those relations going while at the same time trying to undermine the regime that's currently existing. Um, I'm now going to take us to um, Professor Nick Grieve, and thank you, Francois. Uh, and now to Professor Nick Grieve. I should tell everybody that, um, in case you don't know me, um, my name is Helena Kennedy, and I am a member of Doughty Street Chambers, and uh, um, I've been a barrister for more years than I'm prepared to tell you, mm -hmm. and uh, and uh, I and in Queen's Council, and I and I also um, I'm in the um, upper chamber of our Parliament. Uh, I also run the International Bar Associations. Institute of Human Rights. And so um, we're, we're, we're deeply engaged with Belarus and I want to collaborate with all of you um, to try and improve the situation. So um, over to Nick Grief. Um, Nick, um, you are our AV expert. So fill us in on areas of law that most of us are not that familiar with. Thank you very much indeed, Helena. Um, I'd like to start by mentioning uh, anecdotally that uh, Flight Radar 24, which some of our audience may be familiar with, it's a real-time flight tracking app. Uh, flight Radar 24 showed that um, at the start of the Ryanair plane's diversion, it was just 72 kilometres from Vilnius Airport and 183 kilometres from Minsk. And that the distance actually flown from the start of the diversion to landing at Minsk was some 300 kilometers. That helps, I think, to put some, some context into place here. Well, soon after the forced landing, uh, the International Civil Aviation Organization, ICAO, uh, which is a specialized agency of the UN, said that it was concerned about, quote, an apparent forced landing which could be in contravention of the Chicago Convention. And that was a reference to the 1944 Chicago Convention on International Civil Aviation, to which Belarus has been a party uh, since the 4th of July, 1993. The, the membership of the convention is virtually universal. I think it has 193 parties today. At a special meeting on the 27th of May, uh, ICAO's 36 member council agreed to investigate the incident. And it did so under Article 54, paragraph N of the convention, which says that the council shall consider any matter relating to the convention, which any contracting state refers to it. And the council acted after various countries, uh, including the UK, uh, had called for an investigation into the incident. Now, Ikeo's uh, uh, interim report is, I think, due to be published 
uh, on the 25th of June. Whether it will be made public, I, I don't yet know. But that's the date I've seen, the 25th of June. It's going to be a fact-finding investigation designed mainly to establish, quote, whether there were any breaches by an ICAO member state of international aviation law, including the Chicago Convention and its annexes. I should just add that ICAO has very little authority or scope to punish defaulting member states other than by suspending their voting powers in the ICAO assembly uh, and the council under article 88 of the convention. And in fact, last week it tweeted, uh, we wish to remind those who demanded that we take punitive action, that our agency was never assigned that type of role or capability. I'll say a little bit more about uh, the disputes and default chapter of the Chicago Convention uh, a, a bit later on. Uh, we clearly need to wait for ICAO's fact-finding report, but on the face of it, Belarus has committed uh, a, a flagrant violation of the Chicago Convention, uh, in particular unlawful interference with a civil aircraft in flight. It's also committed, I suggest, an offence under the Montreal Convention, for the suppression of unlawful acts against civil aviation, 1971. The Chicago Convention has, as I mentioned, 193 states parties, including Belarus, and it applies because the Ryanair aircraft was a civil aircraft. Uh, it wasn't a state aircraft. In other words, uh, a military or other government aircraft. And that's crucial because the, the convention is applicable only to civil aircraft. The Montreal Convention applies because, and I quote, the place of takeoff or landing, actual or intended, of the aircraft was situated outside the territory of the aircraft's state of registration. And we know that the aircraft was registered in Poland. So I'll briefly consider each of those conventions and uh, remedies under them in, in turn. But first, I'd like to explain why, in my view at least, uh, Belarus's actions do not constitute piracy or hijacking, even though both of those terms have been used to describe those actions. It, it, it's, they're certainly not piracy under the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea, 1982, um, the relevant provisions being Articles 101 and 102. Um, basically, although there appears to have been an illegal act by the crew of one aircraft against the crew and passengers on board another aircraft, it wasn't committed for private ends, and it didn't take place over the high seas or somewhere else outside the jurisdiction of any state. And in addition, the crew of the military aircraft, the MiG, the intercepting plane, had not mutinied and taken control. So the MiG's acts could not be assimilated to the acts of a private aircraft. In short, then, key elements of the UN Convention's definition of piracy uh, were not satisfied. Nor do I think this constituted hijacking. Unlawful interference with a civil aircraft in flight, yes, but as far as we know, not unlawful seizure of the aircraft by someone on board. And I think it's that someone on board that is critical here. Um, as far as we know, therefore, neither the Tokyo Convention of 1963 nor the Hague Convention 1970 is applicable because the act was not committed by someone physically on board the aircraft. So having considered what this is not, let me turn to the breaches of international law that do appear to have been committed and what can be done about them. Um, a little background about the Chicago regime. The foundation of the regime is the principle that every state has complete and exclusive sovereignty over the airspace above its territory. And the, that's provided in Articles 1 and 2 of the Chicago Convention. And in the Nicaragua case, the International Court of Justice declared that those provisions represent uh, firmly established and long-standing tenets of customary international law. Now, unlike the law of the sea, which grants ships of all states the right of innocent passage through territorial waters, there's no equivalent right in air law. Article six of the Chicago Convention provides, quote, no scheduled international air service may be operated over or into the territory of a contracting state, except with the special permission or authorization of that state and in accordance with the terms of such permission or authorization. Now, 
Ryanair Flight 4978 was clearly a scheduled international air service within the meaning of the Chicago Convention. In the context of the Chicago system, um, it was exercising one of the nine freedoms of the air, uh, a series of reciprocal treaty rights and obligations. And it's the first freedom of the air that is relevant here, the right to fly over a foreign country without landing. That's the freedom of the air that the Ryanair flight was exercising. Now, Belarus is not a party to either of the Chicago system's ancillary multilateral agreements by which this special permission or authorization can be granted. Um, but the other way in which special permission or authorization is granted is through bilateral air services agreements or ASAs. And I understand that Belarus has bilateral ASAs with other European countries to allow their airlines to use its airspace and airports for scheduled international air services. And it may well have breached one or more of those agreements. But I will focus on the relevant provisions of the Chicago and the Montreal conventions. And, and the key provision of Chicago is Article 3 bis, uh, which concerns aerial interception and the use of weapons against civil aircraft in flight. This was inserted into the Chicago Convention by a protocol following the destruction of a Korean airliner by Soviet fighters in 1983. The amending protocol entered into force in 1998 and has 157 parties, including Belarus. Article 3 best provides in paragraph A, the contracting states recognize that every state must refrain from resorting to the use of weapons against civil aircraft in flight, and that in the event of interception, the lives of persons on board and the safety of aircraft must not be endangered. But that is without prejudice to the rights and obligations of states under the UN Charter, including the right of self-defense, of course. Paragraph B of Article 3 BIS says, the contracting states recognize that every state in the exercise of its sovereignty is entitled to require the landing at some designated airport of a civil aircraft flying above its territory without authority, that clearly isn't applicable here, or if there are reasonable grounds to conclude that it's being used for any purpose inconsistent with the aims of the Chicago Convention. For this purpose, it continues, the contracting states may resort to any appropriate means consistent with the relevant rules of international law, including the relevant provisions of the Chicago Convention, which uh, includes, of course, uh, Article 3 bis, uh, Paragraph A, which, as we heard, prohibits the use of weapons and requires that the lives of people on board and the safety of aircraft shall not be endangered. Paragraph C of Article 3 bis begins, every civil aircraft shall comply with an order given in conformity with paragraph B. Now the procedure to be followed by uh, the commander of an intercepted aircraft and the visual signals for use by both intercepting and intercepted aircraft are detailed in Annex 2 to the convention. And Annex 2 recognizes, and this is significant, that interception is always potentially hazardous and should be undertaken only as a last resort. So the key points of Article 3 bis are these, interception only as a last resort, the lives of people on board and the safety of aircraft must not be endangered, and above all, uh, there must be no use of weapons. Now, if there had been a bomb on board the Ryanair aircraft, or if there had been genuine grounds for believing that there was a bomb on board, then I think Belarus would have been entitled to require the plane to land. Um, in terms of Article 3 bis paragraph B, it would arguably have had reasonable grounds for concluding that the aircraft was being used for a purpose inconsistent with the aims of the Chicago Convention. Uh, and for example, in, in July last year, uh, another Ryanair flight from Krakow to Dublin was diverted to Stansted Airport after a note was discovered in one of the washrooms claiming that there were explosives on board. Two RAF fighter jets escorted that plane into Stansted. Uh, nothing suspicious was found, and two people were arrested on suspicion of making threats to endanger an aircraft. Now, there was no bomb on the Ryanair flight uh, 4978 either, 
Indeed, it appears that the Belarusian authorities knew that and that this was used as a pretext for arresting Roman Protasevich and Sofia Sapega. So on the face of it, we have uh, a breach of Article 11E of the Montreal Convention, which states, any person commits an offence if he unlawfully and intentionally communicates information which he knows to be false, thereby endangering the safety of the aircraft. That provision is intended to cover such cases as false signals being relayed to an aircraft with the purpose of diverting it from its intended course. But such conduct will constitute an offence only if the safety of the aircraft is actually endangered. So was the Ryanair aircraft's safety actually endangered? Well, yes, I think it was. Bearing in mind that the plane was intercepted by a MiG fighter, and what the convention says about aerial interception being always potentially hazardous. But the plane was also instructed to land and escorted to Minsk, much further away than its intended destination of Vilnius. And interestingly, the BBC quoted an aviation industry source saying this, the problem is that in interception scenarios like this, the pilots may not be thoroughly prepared for the flight path that they may be asked to follow. And therefore, there can be a higher degree of risk for everyone. You're thrown into what's happening. You no longer have control of the flight plan and the full safety oversight that comes with it. Without knowing the flight plan, your situational awareness is degraded, as is the ability to plan your own flight path to a safe touchdown. And then, of course, there was the very real danger implicit in having that armed military aircraft alongside. Now, I don't know whether the MiG pilots were authorised to use weapons against the Ryanair plane if it had not diverted to Minsk. Uh, as we've heard, Article 3 bis of the Convention prohibits this. But it's worth bearing in mind that in September 1995, uh, a Belarusian helicopter gunship shot down a hot air balloon near Bereza. 60 miles east of the Polish border, killing the two US nationals on board who had been taking part in a, uh, a balloon race. And more recently, in August uh, 2012, Lukashenko ordered Belarusian border guards to prevent aerial intrusions, if necessary, by using weapons against them, after a pro-democracy teddy bear drop near the town of uh, Ivanitz and Minsk. So yes, I think the safety of the plane was endangered by what appears to have been the intentional communication of this false information, contrary to Article 11E of Montreal. If so, there was also a breach of Article 10 of Montreal, which says every state must take all practicable measures for the purpose of preventing the offences in Article 1. Adapting what the International Court said in its judgment in the Bosnian genocide case, it would surely be paradoxical if states were under an obligation to take all practicable measures to prevent the com communication of false information that endangers the safety of a civil aircraft in flight, but were not themselves forbidden to commit such acts. So on the face of it, we have those two breaches of the Montreal Convention. And in addition, various corresponding breaches of Chicago, in particular, a breach of Article 3 bis B of Chicago, because since Belarus did not have reasonable grounds for concluding that the Ryanair aircraft was being used for a purpose inconsistent with the aims of the convention, it wasn't entitled to intercept it and require it to land at a more distant airport, Minsk. It unnecessarily and unreasonably endangered the lives of people on board and the safety of the aircraft itself. In addition, I think there's a breach of Article 4 of the Chicago Convention, whereby each contracting state agrees not to use civil aviation for any purpose inconsistent with the aims of the convention. As the economist's uh, analysis put it, forcing a plane to divert and land under false pretenses could well come under that prohibition. But there's also a breach, I think, of Article 22 of Chicago, which provides that each contracting state agrees to facilitate and expedite navigation by aircraft between the territories of the contracting states and to prevent unnecessary delays to aircraft, crews, passengers, and cargo. 
Now I'm running out of time, so I'll perhaps deal with remedies in uh, very, very briefly. Suffice to say that uh, under Montreal, um, Poland certainly has jurisdiction as the state of registry of the aircraft. And I understand that Poland's prosecutor general has already ordered an investigation. But picking up something that Francois said just now, Article 5, Para 3 of Montreal says that the convention does not exclude any criminal jurisdiction exercised in accordance with national law. So depending upon their national law, other states' parties to Montreal could, I think, exercise criminal jurisdiction on the basis of, on the basis of their nationals were on board the plane. We know, I think, that there were three dual US-Lithuanian nationals on board. So on the face of it, the US has criminal jurisdiction under its air piracy statute. Under Montreal, the dispute, if there is one, cannot go to the International Court of Justice because uh, of a reservation formulated by Belarus. But the court could become involved under Chicago. And I'll end on this. Um, Article 84 of Chicago provides that if any disagreement between two or more contracting states relating to the interpretation or application of the Chicago Convention cannot be settled by negotiation, it shall be decided by the ICAO Council. And it goes on to say that any contracting state may appeal from the dec decision of the Council uh, to an arbitration tribunal or to the International Court of Justice. So a dispute concerning the interpretation and application of provisions of the convention, Chicago Convention, could ultimately be brought before the ICJ. It's not a swift process uh, as the in, uh, invoking of Article 4 uh, by uh, in, in the dispute between Qatar and Saudi Arabia and its allies uh, recently showed. It took uh, over three years for that dispute to be uh, 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 to come before the court and be uh, adjudicated upon by the court. Nevertheless, depending upon uh, on what the ICAO Council decided, Belarus or Poland or other Chicago Convention states uh, could appeal to the ICJ under Article 84. And I'll end with this quote from the first recital of the Chicago Convention, which seems to me to be very fitting. Whereas the future development of international civil aviation can greatly help to create and preserve friendship and understanding among the nations and peoples of the world, yet its abuse can become a threat to the general security. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Nick. Um, that was comprehensive and, and took us into areas of law that most of us um, uh, are not uh, uh, so knowledgeable about. And it was really, really helpful. I'm, I'm really grateful to you. Um, now, some questions are coming up um, and uh, I'd like people to have them in mind. Um, and it may be that um, uh, some of our persons who are coming up might be able to answer them. Ewan Grant, who's a former UK Customs uh, Service Intelligence Analyst, um, for the ex-Soviet states, and he was due to work in Minsk, but got blocked after the 2012 diplomatic dispute, where either where either of the couple, uh, uh, um, Roman and uh, um, uh, uh, Sophia, his girlfriend, blocked after where they uh, were. Sorry, he's asking where they put on the Interpol red notice as suspected terrorists, as the uh, um, president is claiming they were. Um, what are Interpol and Europol saying about that? Um, I suspect that they were not put on it. Um, but if no requests were made, um, can, can a question be asked as to why not, if they were supposed to be terrorists? Um, um, I'm sure we can all guess why. Um, then I've got a question from John Bins, who says, well, you know, why, instead of targeted sanctions, why don't we start thinking about proper, old-fashioned, comprehensive sanctions against Belarus as a whole until it changes its leadership? And then um, uh, I've got um, Alan Flowers, who's saying that he's the chair of the Anglo-Belarusian Society here in the UK. And he says that there's a real concern amongst the Belarusian community um, that, uh, um, that, for example, um, there could be malicious use of Interpol to cancel passports of Belarusians, um, to make it impossible to go there visit family members. And how would that be countered? Um, and also what can and should the UK government do to avoid persons in the UK having um, 
uh, mutual legal assistance used against them, for example, on family issues and other sorts of issues, because apparently we have had mutual uh, legal assistance arrangements um, between uh, ourselves and Belarus. So um, some questions that people might want to answer as we go ahead. Um, and I'm now going to take us to Katia Glod. Katia, um, you're going to give us a, a bit of an insight into uh, the domestic implications of this for Belarus. For Belarus. <laughs> Yes, yeah, thank you very much, Helena. Um, let me, I'm not a lawyer, I'm just a political analyst. So I won't, won't um, go deep into any laws. So just let me perhaps give you an overview about why this happened and the political situation in Belarus. And um, I would like to start by saying that we should actually consider this incident not just as part of aviation, but it's really part of the internal political crisis mm. that we have seen in Belarus since August. And this is very important to remember that this crisis that has so far been contained within Belarus is showing signs of being, of spilling over its borders and becoming potentially a threat, um, at least to Belarus EU member states, if not to the whole um, security, the whole the security of the whole of Europe and the UK, and therefore, obviously, we have to keep this crisis in mind and think not only how we can punish the regime in terms of uh, breaching the aviation laws, but how we can help to solve the political crisis in Belarus. And the situation in Belarus is, uh, um, you know, is currently very, very um, grim. Um, the regime is striving for survival, and uh, perhaps this is why it dared to do such an audacious um, action as to force this plane to land, because uh, um, probably, I'm only guessing, the international implications of this uh, um, accident haven't been really hadn't been really calculated by the Belarusian KGB. It's not so sophisticated. It's still thinking in terms of Soviet paradigms. But I think more importantly is that regime did not really care about the international consequences. It's all very much focused on the domestic situation in Belarus, and it wants to have a very clean space, a uh, very quiet environment before the um, uh, constitutional referendum that is now going to take place in February, um, next February. And Lukashenko very much hopes that through this constitutional referendum, he will be able to put through the amendments that will allow him to remain in power, be it as the head of a super presidential body or as uh, an indirectly elected, indirectly elected president. That remains to be seen. He probably has not decided <coughs> himself, but that's where what, what he is looking at, and this is what he probably has an arrangement with um, uh, about with Russia. And Russia is obviously, Putin is obviously supporting him in, in that it does not need to push Lukashenko to step down immediately. Um, Russian analysts think that he, Putin might decide to tighten the screws uh, further um, ahead, maybe around 2024, when uh, Putin will have to be re-elected because it would be good for public opinion in Russia. But what is clear is that this uh, um, airplane accident is clearly uh, very much in line with this huge wave of repression we have seen against society in Belarus. Um, we have been uh, we have seen over 35,000 people being prosecuted um, to date. We have around 500 political prisoners. And uh, Roman Protasevich, he was the editor of one of the uh, uh, most popular Telegram channels in Belarus. And Telegram app is basically where people, most people in Belarus today get their news from because the access to access to independent media has been restricted. People basically are unable to read any um, online um, independent newspapers. They have to go to Telegram because Telegram helps to um, block this and internet um, blackout that the authorities have imposed on other independent newspapers. And that's why um, that's why Roman Protasevich was targeted because Telegram is really is really seen as the tool behind mobilization in Belarus. And it's also a way to 
uh, for people to get informed. And obviously, Lukashenko is very worried. He's very anxious. Yes, on the face of it, he lo it looks like he has suppressed the protests. And um, he has control, uh, has reestablished control over society. But I think people understand that this is all very temporary, that the frustration and uh, the satisfaction with his policies, they have not disappeared, they have only um, gone up. And now you can hear more from people in Belarus, how even more they hate this regime, because as Belarus is still mostly state-owned economy, most a lot of people were um, fired for taking part in the protest, and people are being suppressed at their working places, and they really see their management, their superiors, as only those who implement the orders of the regime rather than actually listening to the people and what people want and therefore the hatred towards the regime is very it's very high but at the same time people in Belarus feel feel very frustrated they really looking up to the west for help um, it's almost like an outcry for help and uh, um, a cry for humanitarian support because they feel powerless. They felt like they've taken to the streets in big numbers and they now realize protests are not enough to bring down the regime, but they really, they really don't know what else they can do. And obviously the fact that most of the opposition are outside of the country is not helping. Um, we have a small faction of, of uh, the opposition, the members of the coordinating council who are working inside the country, and they are trying to do a lot of good work. For example, they're trying to establish something like a second society, something that we saw during the Polish solidarity, the idea of Adam Miknik and something that we saw in Serbia during the regime of Slobodan Milosevic, but when basically civil society tries to create its own structures and tries to function, to pay less attention to the state and its propaganda, but create its own networks of solidarity, its alternative uh, parliament. For example, the Coordinating Council has set up this assembly of deputies, of publicly elected deputies. There are over 100 people over the whole country. And they, con they continuously meet online and debate issues um, about reforms in Belarus, about transitional justice and other things. We have now almost in Belarus an alternative culture um, when, uh, um, for example, about the, the main theater in Belarus, perhaps the main drama, Belarusian drama theater had to go underground because it supported um, the protest and now they perform YouTube on the on YouTube and they put um, many good online performances that people treat as their main um, channel of receiving culture in Belarus. And um, uh, whereas the rest of the opposition, as I said, they are, they are outside of Belarus, they're doing a great job on the international arena, but they don't really have so much connection with society inside Belarus. And the same way Mrs. Tikhanovska, the leader of the opposition, she probably also doesn't know what to do apart from relying on the West. Um, some months ago, there was an idea to organize an international conference, and we had now international conference on the elections in Belarus. But I think people understand that this is all very much symbolic, and this is kind of more for the future when there is any likelihood of transition, but at the moment we don't see any likelihood of transition. And in fact, we see a very high tide of repression. And um, uh, the situation, as I said at the beginning, is quite uh, is quite doom and gloom. But the only the only positive thing is that, as I said, that society has uh, changed. People want different governments. They definitely uh, they are not accepting Lukashenko. He cannot win any election or referendum without rigging. Rigging, the, uh, rigging them, and people will continue to manifest their demands one way or another, even if they have to go um, underground at the moment. Therefore, I very much support the idea to have more engagement with the Belarusians. And for example, one of the latest polls, I should mention that polls in Belarus are prohibited, and these are all online polls which uh, um, cover only urban Belarusians. But for example, 39% thir uh, of people in Belarus now say that they would like to have greater ties with the EU, even at the expense of ties uh, um, 
good ties with Russia and um, uh, people who are against that are 30 percent so now we see more and more people who in Belarus who actually want to be closer to the EU and who want to look and they look to the west for the, the for the western support and therefore the idea for example to put sanctions on the Bolivia probably was a good uh, PR stand but it really it's uh, it can be compared to locking the uh, the oppressed with their oppressor. People really feel very frightened in Belarus, and now they feel completely locked up with this dictatorship. There is uh, the land border in Belarus has been closed for Belarusians since last December, which means now the only way for people like you know people who would like to travel of course not many people can travel now because of covid but nonetheless people were looking forward to getting their vaccines and getting at least on holiday to europe and now they cannot do that so the only ways to do that illegally through russia to pretend that you're going to russia first and then from russia try to to fly to um, um, other european countries and that's obviously not helping people in belarus and um, with regards to coming back to Roman Protasevich case, I would like to mention that there was, of course, further development to that. On Thursday night, the Belarusian state television broadcast what they called an interview, which was really an hour and a half, a very difficult uh, um, well, interview with Roman Pro Protasevich, which was clearly given under duress, and where he came across as A, being very frightened, very scared and we know that the authorities now trying to frighten him with extraditing him to Lugansk to um, Ukraine to to Lugansk uh, prosecutor services because apparently there are strong allegations which look like they confirmed that he took part in the Azov um, Ukrainian regiment, uh, um, which was perhaps in 2015, he was not only, he acted not only as a journalist, but if, apparently he was deputy head of one of the divisions there. And uh, he is obviously very frightened um, that the Belarusian authorities might extradite him. And we have to remember that it was also in the news the other days that the Luhansk prosecutor's office said that they are actually sending people to Minsk to interrogate him. And he also came across as being um, as, as a person who feels that he was treated quite unfairly by the, by the opposition. And of course, we should not take this interview seriously because it was given under duress. But for people in Belarus, it had quite a strong impact on, on people inside the country. Um, for those people who support the opposition, they took it as uh, um, this is, was all given under duress and probably under torture, and uh, that's all rubbish. But for people who don't like Lukashenko, but still are not actively supporting the opposition, and again, the latest polls show us that there are about 45 of urban Belarusians who, who dislike the regime, but they also don't feel that the opposition is the right force to represent them. That probably had quite a negative impact on them. And that would be would make it more difficult for the opposition to draw new followers. Um, well, I perhaps I should, um, yeah, perhaps I should stop here because there is- Yeah, I'm, I've got to stop you there, Katia, because I'm, we're going to, we've got two more speakers that I want to hear from and I've got a whole lot of questions piling up. That was really, really interesting. Where are you based, Katia? I am based in London at the moment. Yeah. Okay, um, great. Well, it no, was really, really interesting and interesting to get some insight into uh, um, how those who are sort of not don't align themselves automatically with the opposition, but still don't like Lukashenko, but how they, they can be played in different directions. And uh, obviously uh, the, the, the regime knows how to do that. Um, but very, a very interesting review of what's been happening. Um, I, I'm going to turn to Constantin. Hello, um, Ma. Hello, Ma. Sorry, can I just interrupt very quickly? Uh, apologies, but Natalia has to leave at 5.30. And so I wonder whether I, we can go straight to her. Is that all right, Constantine? Well, that, that's probably a good idea. Um, I, um, let's let's go to Natalia. Um, and, uh, and Natalia, if you would like to come in, everyone should know who Natalia is. Natalia is uh, one of the directors of the Belarus Freedom Theatre. She's been in exile in the UK, um, 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 forced into exile, and uh, um, because of what happened, in fact, to, to uh, a very close um, associate. 
who was murdered, and um, and the, the the risks to the life of herself and her husband and her family. And Natalia has been an absolutely incredible voice for Belarus based here in the UK. Natalia, over to you. Uh, Konstantin, thank you so much for giving uh, your place for me to speak. And I'm sorry because I need to uh, jump to another conference where I'm also uh, speaking. And thank you so much for organizing this event. Uh, probably I will start from the context, uh, even though uh, Katya gave this internal context, but uh, I will give the context that is connected to dissidents who live abroad and uh, what kind of threats been received uh, by many of them. Uh, over 2021, Protasevich and other civilian activists were explicitly threatened by the representatives of Lukashenko regime that they will be caught and killed. On February 12, 2021, the head of Belarus KGB, Ivan Tsertsey, uh, Ivan Tertil, uh, as we say in Belarusian, claimed that all traitors of motherland will be found and brought to justice despite their location even decades later. On April 29, 2021, General Mikhail Karpinkov publicly announced that all participants of democratic movement and participants of peaceful protest will face an inevitable retribution. Karpinkov insisted that civilians who exercise their political rights will be treated as terrorists and will be fought against by the laws of counter-terrorist operations. General Karpinkov is currently the head of internal forces, the largest punitive unit of the Ministry of Internal interior in Belarus. He previously was the chief of Gubopik, Gubazik, the chief organized crime and corruption fighting directorate. And it's personally responsible for the use of torture and other crimes against humanity conducted by his organization and an aftermath in August 2020 events. On the state TV address, Karpinkov particularly referred to kill on spot US operation against Osama bin Laden and promised to use the same approach to civil activists from Belarus who live abroad. Prior to that, Karpinkov promised his subordinates no accountability for any use of weaponry during punitive operation against civilians. When referring to clean sweep operation, Karpinkov referred to Israel and American operation abroad, thus announcing, among others, armed extraditional attacks on foreign soil against civilians and their families and children. Uh, on April 29, a protege of Karpinkov, Shpakovsky, and now the Belarus state security is now considering all politically active groups of Belarus immigrants abroad as terrorists and enemies of the nation and will begin a clean sweep operation against Belarusian immigrants in Poland, Lithuania, Ukraine, and other countries. Shpakovsky is one of the key pro-Russian figures in Lukashenko's close circle, a trusted representative of informal pro-Russian state propaganda network. On the same day, state security units loyal to Lukashenko posted a threatening video addressing political opponents of Lukashenko and treating to use force against them. All security officials, represented police and the army, special response units and assault groups were heavily armed and only a few showed their faces. Another, the last quote uh, before we move to actions. Both Shpakovsky and Gadukevich, who enjoy full media support of state-owned media and presidential administration, urge to kidnap more activists living abroad and bring them to Belarus in a vehicle trunk against international and national laws. Just like Spakovsky, Gudukevich is closely tied to Russian political elite. He is accused of the coordination of torture and crimes against humanity at the time of his work as chief of police in one of the areas in Minsk in 2000, before being assigned as a position to the parliament. Uh, that's exactly that particular context that we have for today in Belarus for every single dissident that lives abroad and who runs major operations. I'm not even mentioning what's happening inside of Belarus with people who live in Belarus, who get arrested every single day, who continue to be tortured, and political prisoners number is increasing every single day. Uh, talking here uh, in terms of the framework and what could be done, 
uh, in terms of international jurisdiction. According to Lithuanian Foreign Minister Gabriel Lansbergis, at least 131 passengers were EU citizens from Austria 1, Belgium 1, Bulgaria 1, Cyprus 1, Germany 3, Spain 1, France 9, Greece 11, Lithuania 94, Latvia 2, Poland 4, and Romania 5. So here we get to the point uh, where the whole European Union is affected by this hijacking. And here we get to the point why only when Lukashenko decided to hijack this airplane, EU got excited in terms of their response, in terms of sanctions. Why, uh, when it was provided with a strategy, EU didn't work on time, wasted time and lives of Belarusians. So the question is, uh, for 27 years, we have people who are kidnapped and killed. Bodies are not found. It's happening not since the last August. It's happening for the last 27 years. And only now, when this airplane got hijacked, suddenly European Union decided to move from their four-step strategy. And the first step is wait and see. The question is, for what to wait and what else to see. EU must act, UK must act, Magnitsky Act currently includes a possibility to sanction money backs. All papers on Gutsiriev and his family been provided to UK government in October, November, December with refreshed files in all months of 2021. Since that time, nothing is done by the UK government, even having Magnitsky Act in place with a new unit included a month ago. If we talk ICC and we work with global diligence uh, lawyers who work on ICC, we uh, call on the British government to refer the situation in Belarus to the ICC prosecutor under Article 14 of the Rome Statute. And there is a reasonable basis to believe that crimes against humanity have taken place within the jurisdiction of the court, including forced deportation, persecution, and now the arrest of two civilians abroad, a Polish registered aircraft. As for the supplementary submission, we're asking the ICC prosecutor to take the flight FR4978 incident into consideration of the following grounds. First, the detention of Protasevich and Ms. Sapega a board fight may qualify as a crime against humanity of illegal detention as it took place as a part of the widespread and systematic attack on the civilian population pursued to the Lukashenko regime policy. Second, the illegal detention falls within the jurisdiction of ICC as the conduct took place abroad a Polish registered aircraft. Third, the incident continues relevant contextual information that should form part of the prosecuted decision to open a full investigation, the gravity of the situation in Belarus. Fourth, the very simple thing that uh, Ms. Tikhanovska must be invited to G7 summit. French side suggested that to the UK, but the UK unfortunately is not working towards that idea and we must push the government on it. And uh, to finalize, accountability platform and mechanism has to full force start its working because till now the platform is not yet launched. And simple action, just to repeat, Magnitsky Act must be put in place against Lukashenko money bags. EU must, must put everything in place in terms of financial and economic sanctions. Again, the final one, 27 years of dictatorship. It's not new situation. And we must continue to work now, not waste time and not to lose lives anymore. Thank you so much. Natalia, thank you. That was uh, um, really important to hear, hear you. And, uh, and we, we know that you have to, to, to go. And so if you want to have, if you want to head off now, um, uh, do so um, and you can have a, uh, a glass of water and whatever else before you start your next um, uh, uh, Zoom call. Um, Constantin, um, thank you for ceding to uh, Natalia that you're a gentleman. Anyway, um, it's great to have you with us. And um, Constantin uh, is, uh, uh, Ziaru, is a, a professor um, in, it's, you're in Liverpool, aren't you? Yeah, that's and, right. Uh, and he's uh, an expert in human rights. Um, and so he's going to speak about the domestic 
an international situation from his perspective. Can Thank you. Th Thank you very much, Helena. Thank you very much, uh, uh, colleagues. And uh, uh, since I'm the last one, uh, uh, I, was, I have to say that some things that I was going to say uh, uh, have already been said, uh, which is great. So I will try to uh, lose as little of your time as possible. I'm not going to talk about aviation law at all. Uh, I have I have to admit that uh, uh, last week I read uh, probably the biggest number of aviation conventions that I have ever uh, read <laughs> in my entire life, and uh, um, I think that uh, uh, Professor Grief uh, actually uh, made an amazing uh, observation. I also talked uh, with a colleague of mine about uh, what happened with Ryanair in our a uh, short article in the conversation last week. But what I wanted to say, I wanted to really to uh, echo what Mark said that, and some other said that this is a, uh, an element, a part of a puzzle that should be placed in much longer narrative. We need to remember that more than a year ago, uh, Sergei Tikhanovsky, the husband of Svetlana Tikhanovska, was arrested in, in, in Belarus. And that even that was not the beginning of the story of the narrative of human rights abuse and human rights uh, uh, violations in, in Belarus. So in the next couple of minutes, I will try to make three general observations. First, I will try to look into uh, the uh, stages of uh, human rights abuses that happened in Belarus. Then I will try to make a uh, sense of what actually can be done from human rights perspective in terms of liability. And finally, uh, I will enter in the area that is not very uh, natural for me. I will try to look into what uh, 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 has been just said about the reaction of the European Union and this tsunami of negative uh, reflections on this issue of Ryanair flight. So first thing, uh, the, the stages, uh, very briefly, we knew that uh, and a, a little bit under a year ago in the very similar seminar, I was arguing that in Belarus, every single uh, right that is enshrined in the European Convention on Human Rights was violated, uh, including right to life, prohibition of torture. I know that Belarus is not, uh, uh, has not ratified the European Convention, but similar corresponding rights can be found in the UN uh, Covenant, etc. cetera, and, uh, and, uh, as well as uh, Convention Against Torture, uh, as well as uh, other human rights conventions. Uh, did we have a reaction to that? Yes, we did. But uh, uh, most of the uh, uh, reactions kind of ended with, with a question about what else can we do? Uh, then the uh, very active phase ended. And then we started to have plenty of criminal cases uh, uh, against those who participated in events. And uh, uh, we again have plenty of uh, procedural and uh, uh, procedural violations related to fair trial. We have uh, uh, arbitrary detentions. We have absolutely crazy stories about people being uh, prosecuted for uh, sending emojis in chats or leaving, I don't know, white, red, white flag in, the, uh, in, 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 in their uh, windows. Then we have a, an attack on certain groups like journalists and human rights defenders. My uh, colleague, uh, Sergei Drozdrovsky from the uh, office uh, that is working on uh, uh, rights uh, uh, for people with disabilities is under home arrest, even despite the fact that he himself is uh, uh, in uh, in a wheelchair, cannot uh, uh, has to use wheelchair for for movement, and this is going on. And did we have reactions to this? Yes, we did, of course. But the reaction is no way comparable to what happened as a result of the uh, Ryanair hijacking. 
Uh, then we have this extraordinary rendition of Roman Protasevich and uh, uh, his girlfriend Sapega. And then now we have an interview which Katya has already covered. So I didn't see this interview. I think uh, that uh, uh, no truth can come from uh, a person who is under duress or was tortured uh, uh, during the preliminary stages of, of this process. So now the question is, what can be done with this uh, uh, major uh, number of potential human rights, uh, real uh, human rights violations? Now, we can use the European Convention, the European Court of Human Rights to some extent, uh, because it's been known that some um, Belarusians are extraordinarily uh, re returned from Bel to Belarus from Russia. This in itself might be a violation of the European Convention on Human Rights. Um, Russia can be brought to Strasbourg. The uh, airplane was uh, registered in Poland, so potentially we can connect Poland to this issue. However, it is very difficult because Poland will have to be a respondent state and it's very difficult to actually say what's uh, from the European Convention on Human Rights Poland could have done uh, on top of what they already did. Uh, I think Professor Grief mentioned the International Court of Justice. That's absolutely correct from my perspective. It can be involved as well. Uh, universal jurisdiction of countries that are surrounded is a very potentially good issue, which has already started, but uh, we have been discussing this a year ago as well, that this might be useful. It needs to be uh, actually done. Finally, uh, the UN was, uh, uh, although some uh, parts of the UN were quite active in the in the responding to the issue, generally uh, the effectiveness of these actions is uh, very limited for a very number, very big number of reasons. Mostly, the reason is the uh, inability of the UN system to do much for uh the problems with the infrastructure of their bodies but uh, at least the un panel was established and uh, the un panel members will have to work hard uh to actually uh, make sure that uh, uh this is not a huge waste of time that they are going to do something in relation and create a quasi judicial institution to uh, at least document uh, and uh, preserve the evidence of uh, ill treatment in Belarus. So this is a very quick bird eye uh, view on the uh, bodies that can do something. And finally, that I wanted to uh, speculate a little bit on uh, basically on what was going on throughout this year. Uh, my question is, uh, we, saw, we saw in the last couple of weeks, uh, we saw a huge amount of reactions. But this reaction was not because people in Belarus were tortured, killed, uh, freedom of expression was repressed, but because uh, the EU airplane was landed, forcefully landed in in, in Belarus, of course, this is outrageous I, uh, and this is a violation of uh, international law, but violations of human rights, is, uh, there are also violations of international law. One can argue that uh, it is even a violation of use cogens, which is the central part of international law, but we haven't, we haven't heard, we haven't seen such reaction at all. And as a question that I would ask, what if Roman Protasevich was not uh, arrested like he was arrested, but he was just kidnapped from the territory of Lithuania and brought back to, uh, to Minsk by car, for example? Would the reaction of the European Union be as significant, as forceful, and as clear as it was in relation to the airplane? And my answer to this is no. So, uh, and I want to finish by referring back to what Marx was saying about internationalizations of these crimes. Yes, it, it is an important uh, uh, kind of additional, additional uh, feature of these crimes, but this doesn't make the whole problem more or less problematic. The problem is that people are tortured, uh, uh, 
in prison, uh, in, in, in Belarus or elsewhere, it's beyond the point. I know that it becomes more visible for the world when these crimes uh, are internationalized, but it is not really the point. The point is that, uh, well, human rights of Roman Protasevich and anyone who is in prison in Belarus should be kind of uh, considered uh, as uh, similar rights. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you very much, Helena, for an interesting uh, seminar. And you are muted. You've been such a constant voice here in the UK, um, raising the issues of Belarus, raising the abuses, raising the, the contraventions of rights. Um, and I just want to pay tribute to you for, for doing that with, with, with such constancy. So it's really been great working with you. Now, um, I'm going to go to some of the questions here. Does anyone have an answer to this business about whether um, uh, um, the, uh, the couple who were um, taken off the plane and, uh, and arrested, were they, and it's claimed that they're terrorists, where, was there a red notice um, based, placed with Interpol? or with Europol? And if not, why not? Do we know? Um, um, I'm oh. then going to, does anybody have an answer to that? Yeah, can, can, I, can um, I just I, speculate? Yeah. Uh, they were on the flight between uh, uh, two EU uh, countries. And I very much doubt that if we're, they were on the red uh, uh, list, they would be even uh, uh, allowed yeah. to be there. So of course, Absolutely. well, uh, Roman Protasevich clearly was on the Belarusian list of uh, uh, potential extremists, whatever they call, but not uh, anywhere else. I would, I would say. Yeah, and we and we know that authoritarian governments call anybody they don't like a, a, a terrorist. So um, I think we can we can take it for granted that there was no red notice. Um, uh, John Bins is asking about whether there shouldn't be. Um, instead of targeted sanctions, comprehensive sanctions. Anyone got a view and like to come in on that? Ambassador? No. Um, uh, I mean, what tends to happen is you do a combination of both. Um, Alan Flowers is, uh, has raised this business about um, the position of people, um, the, the potential for, for malicious use of, um, of, of powers where the Belarus regime might try to invoke mutual legal assistance in order to sort of uh, um, assist in prosecutions for political purposes against family members of persons in Belarus. There's been no effort, I think, to do that. And I think that um, mutual legal assistance would be resisted certainly here in the United Kingdom. Um, there's also a question about the malicious use of Interpol to cancel passports. I don't think we know of that having happened so far. Um, someone called George is asking about, um, he's saying that Alex Saab was detained in Cape Verde in 2020 at the behest of the US because he's helping Venezuelans survive the sanctions regime imposed by, by the West. Um, like Belarus sending a fighter jet, the US sent a warship to affect this. Um, do we, I mean, basically the question is, are we operating double standards? Can, the, uh, uh, can we, uh, deal with that, um, I'll, I'll see if anyone, does anybody want to come in on that? We know that double standards operate around the world on all these things. Um, Kansantin, you had your hand up. Yeah, uh, uh, I, 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 I just want to say a couple of words on that. It, like one human rights violation doesn't justify another human mm, rights violation. Mm, mm. Look, like it is, uh, it is too easy to say that, uh, well, uh, th th there are problems in uh, the U.S., so the U.S. can never say anything to anyone in relation to human rights violations. From the case law of the European Court of Human Rights, we know that there are violations against each and every member. Mm. There are mm. cases against all 47 contracting parties to the European Convention on Human Rights, but I would think about the question of scale, that's uh, uh, issue number one, and the pre question of liability. And uh, if there, in Belarus there is no internal mechanism of liability for human rights violations, so that's why, uh, that's why it is important to uh, talk about that, and uh, in no way I would uh, uh, 
say that we shouldn't discuss uh, uh, allegations of torture in uh, uh, or in, uh, 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 extraordinary rendition cases where CIA were uh, involved. Not, not of course we should, but it doesn't justify at all what is happening in Belarus. And I think that we really need to make it clear. Thank you. Okay. Uh, um, well, George, who was pointing out the fact that America gets up to bad things too, and and uh, and uh, uh, um, has uh, raises also the fact that um, um, Raman um, was uh, uh, he apparently volunteered to fight in Ukraine with the neo-Nazi Azov battalion. I mean, uh, you know, the, the the truth is that uh, um, you know you can you can start picking and choosing. Who you, whose human rights matter more. As far as I'm concerned, you have to protect the human rights of whoever, um, um, because otherwise you end up uh, um, finding an excuse for not protecting anybody's. Mm. Um, he, mm. George is saying, as with Navalny, isn't it in the interest of, uh, of uh, our case uh, and in support of uh, um, uh, human rights and uh, international law, and, uh, and, and if you like, a rules-based order, isn't it in the interest of our case to um, expose the fact that, for example, it's, it's, uh, it's known of Navalny, Navalny that he at different times has said things that uh, were anti-Semitic. Um, um, uh, and, uh, you know, I think that more and more people know these things. Um, and, uh, and sometimes nationalism, unfortunately, has this, uh, you know, potential for being ethnic nationalism rather than civic nationalism. I would advise any, any uh, uh, nation like uh, the, the opposition in Belarus to, uh, to look at Scotland, which talks about civic nationalism um, rather than ethnic nationalism. Although I don't happen to be somebody who supports independence there either, but anyway. Um, but uh, um, is there anybody, anything they want to say about this, about the business of Navalny, you know, uh, we now have him being a bad guy. I mean, by comparison with Putin, I'm sorry, he, he kind of is small fry in the bad mistakes as far as I'm concerned. But has anybody got anything they want to say on this? I see yeah, you saying, Mac. Can, can I come in, Helena? Is that all right? Yeah, it's yeah. Jonathan here. Um, Jonathan, um, yes, please. Um, I, I sort of wanted to ask Mac some questions, if that's okay. Do, about please. About the sort of, the, the kind of, the, the regime around extraordinary rendition. Yes. And, you know, um, how relevant that is to, to this. And you referred to um, Roman's um, detention as extraordinary rendition. And I wonder if you could develop that a bit more and explain the extent to which that is a useful framework to one, look at this, and, uh, and two, does it provide additional remedies and support? Because also might want to come in from the, the Strasbourg approach on, on extraordinary rendition too. Sure. Um, I, I certainly think that there's a much extra work that should be done about um, considering this through the lens of extraordinary rendition, not least of all because I think one thing is, is palpably clear, and it goes to something that Elena was pointing out in response to one of the questions around there being <clears throat> uh, possible uh, uh, attempts at mutual legal cooperation, which is I think that the reality is that Belarus knows it wouldn't be able to use the usual channels. It wouldn't be able to use the usual mutual legal cooperation framework or the extradition requests that we understand ordinarily to be used in these types of contexts, because there would be the obvious defense, which is that uh, there would be the political offense exception uh, that would be, be potentially raised in respect of anybody uh, who was a dissident and an op opponent of the government. And they, they, they must know this, Belarus knows this, and they know as a result that they wouldn't be able to use the normal ch channels available to them to be able to lay their hands on the return of anybody who was abroad and criticizing the Belarus regime. And so that just confirms to me that what you've seen here is some form of extraordinary rendition outside of the usual framework. And I think that that simply underlines the uh, extra extraterritorial nature of these crimes. And what I said was the growing nature of what seems to be transnational suppression. And I think it's important for us to see these types of crimes and these events as, as, as I suggested in my talk, as patterned. Because once one sees the patterns, it's not then only a case of, of what happened in, in Belarus. It's a case of what's happening in Navalny's context and being poisoned outside of your country. And, uh, and, and, and uh, these types of efforts just highlight how fragile it is to think that 
um, th this is something that doesn't occur across boundaries. And it's related something uh, to something which I think we, we, we haven't had time to speak about, but which frankly also gives me somewhat, um, somewhat uh, of, of a pause. And that is that we have witnessed a number of regimes starting from Russia um, a, a, and a number of its allies attempting to destabilize and infiltrate democracies outside. And that happened in the US elections. It happened, we know that there are examples of it having happened in respect of, of other democracies as well. And so when you speak about the types of extraterritorial powers that are being asserted and exercised here, whether it's in attempting to interfere in democracies or when there are people that are criticizing your regime, then snatching them either from the air or out of other cities in other countries to be brought back into your territory extraordinarily, then I really do think you see you, you begin to see the problem for what it is. These are repressive, the repressive autocratic regimes that simply do not think that the rules apply to them. And until such time as there's a response which says that this is unacceptable behavior, they'll continue doing it. Thank you very much. I'm I'm going to uh, I'm I'm looking through. First of all, um, um, Miriam Goldman's asking about um, will the recording be available after today? Jonathan um, or Ramonda Ray, will it be available um, tomorrow? Someone missed the beginning of this. Uh, yes, uh, it will be. Thank so you very much. So Miriam, Miriam, it will be available to, from tomorrow. Um, okay. Um, Ryanair is a private sector company. Other businesses operate in or have supply chains involving Belarus. What are their obligations and what are the legal implications for them as a result of this incident? Do corporate actors have a role to play and what is it? Who would like to come in on that? Ryanair has been very quiet. Mm. Yes, definitely. Um, can you hear me? Yes, you can. Yes, definitely. I think that uh, um, private companies um, can be uh, very, very effective, in fact, um, for human rights issues in general. And um, also, um, uh, su such a very popular company, su such as Ryana, can be very effective as well. And I absolutely share this comment that this company seems to have been quite silent. And this silence is quite shocking, in fact. And uh, I do think that, uh, you know, in the long, um, the long course of human rights throughout the history of humanity, uh, it's like a rocket with four steps. Uh, first step is uh, the individuals such as Roman, who for millenniums have promoted the rights to speak and sometimes ended uh, on fire, on cross, or in jail. Uh, then the instit international institutions and the UN, especially. Then the third step was uh, NGOs and foundations. And now we are at the fourth step of the rocket, which is the private sector. But if the private sector doesn't play its role, um, it's a failure, uh, which has, been, has to be denounced. Because they absolutely they are a victim of, of that as well. Thank you, Francois. That's a, that, that was a very comprehensive answer about the responsibilities that should be borne. Um, uh, uh, Alan uh, Flowers is raising again his concern about um, mutual legal assistance. Does the panel know not know how there have been cases where Belarus used mutual legal assistance in Poland? Um, um, I'm sure that they've used mutual legal assistance in Poland, but uh, have they used it in circumstances as, as political as this? Uh, Max, I mean, you, you seem to be saying that, that it would be unlikely and that Belarus and uh, Litvinenko clearly know the limitations and the exemptions that there are when it comes to uh, matters of, of a political nature. Uh. So, so sorry, Helena. Can I can I just jump in quickly? Yes, please. Uh, basically, if you remember, uh, quite a few years back, uh, the mutual legal assistance was used uh, uh, to uh, have to, to gather evidence in the, in the case of Ales Bilatsky, who was uh, and still is the uh, head of uh, human rights NGO in Belarus, and uh, he was in prison for a couple of years. 
uh, for not paying taxes for tax evasion uh, because it was effectively impossible to work for this NGO in Belarus. And the data uh, from bank transfers were collected from uh, uh, the were transferred by, I think, the Lithuanian, I might be wrong on that, uh, uh, by the Lithuanian prosecutorial service. So um, I hope that since then they actually uh, changed their. Uh, um, ways of replying to this request by the Belarusian authorities, but in the past, indeed, these uh, uh, channels were used to actually uh, take the information, at least. Uh, I, I'm sure that it would be harder to ask to extradite, for example, a person from Lithuania, etc. Like, it would be harder to uh, well, the, the person who is about to be extradited would say that it's uh, actually a political motivation extradition. But when we talk about documents, that's uh, at least it used to be possible to use uh, mutual legal assistance. Thank you. Nick, did I see you wanting to come in on anything? No. I've um, answered a question uh, in the chat. Thanks, Helena. Oh, I see you've answered a question that was in the chat. Let me have a little look. That's good. About Pre President Morales' claim. Oh. Well, can you, do, can you answer it verbally? Sure, yeah. Uh, George was asking uh, about similarities or distinctions uh, between uh, the incident involving President Morales, the Bolivian president's plane in 2013, and the recent incident. Uh, and uh, I don't know all the facts, but I do believe that uh, there was no aerial interception in the 2013 case. It was just that certain countries closed their airspace to the plane in the belief that Edward Snowden, the whistleblower, was on board. But more fundamentally, uh, I'm assuming that the president's plane was a state aircraft and therefore the Chicago Convention wouldn't have been applicable. Very interesting. Yeah. Okay, Jonathan, I see your hand coming up. Well, I've just got a, a sort of a quick observation, really, based upon the detention of um, Ochilan in, in, in Kenya. And obviously when that ended up at the Strasbourg Court, and I appreciate the Strasbourg Court has no jurisdiction over Belarus, but there is Ochilan in Kenya being um, detained. And the moment they lay their hands upon him, in fact, probably even before then, uh, Turkey's international human rights treaty obligations were engaged and so that must happen equally in this situation where Belarus's international human rights treaty obligations are engaged the moment they conceived of the idea of, 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 of somehow taking control of, of the aircraft um, which would then kick in all those obligations under the ICCPR and any other relevant international treaty, and obviously the Working Group on Arbitrary Detention. Uh, but what occurs to me is that for though, for everybody that was on board that was detained, is it was an unlawful detention. I think it'd be very hard to argue that they weren't detained and that that detention was unlawful. And so, I mean, I, I'm not sure it's that big a point, but obviously, as we know, under Article 9 of the ICCPR, you are entitled to you, you are, you, to compensation in the event that you are arbitrarily detained, and so all of the people on the plane are entitled to. I would have thought some quite healthy compensation. Um, obviously, there's more for Ivan, Roman, and Sophia, but um, but everybody must be entitled to compensation for for the experience that they went through because it was arbitrary detention. I don't know if anybody's got any thoughts on that and whether that line of cases around Ochelan and Carlos the Jackal have any relevance to this situation. Obviously, you are dealing with a completely different set of circumstances, factual circumstances, but you know, the Strasbourg court has basically said that it was lawful to detain both Carlos the Jackal, uh, or not, not, not lawful, not in breach of the ECHR, as long as those protections were in place to detain both Carlos the Jackal and um, Ochelan. So um, as long as, uh, if that applies then to Roman's situation, as long as he's accorded all of his rights under the ICCPR. Um, would, that, would that cancel out the, 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 the uh, uh, offences created by um, bringing an aeroplane down in order to access him? 
I, 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 I would personally um, happily argue on the other side. <laughs> I don't know that. Uh, um, but I, I see here that uh, Torlach, Torlach, my friend Torlach Denehan from Ireland, is saying that Ryanair was initially very coy in its response, but the um, chief executive officer subsequently made a strong state statement that referred to state piracy, etc. Um, but he raises the point that um, British American, is it British American Tobacco, BAT, is it? Is mm. it it's, uh, Anyway, the big tobacco, tobacco um, company and other companies have significant tobacco businesses in Belarus. And some companies like IKEA source a significant volume of products like wood from Belarus. So there are major companies that we should be looking at and drawing to um, uh, the consuming public's attention um, when it comes to um, supply chains. Um, uh, in places like um, Belarus. Um, so um, friends, I'm going to, to draw this to a close now, um, but I just wanted to say that um, in our discussions about um, coming together again, and I hope that some of you have been persuaded to take part as speakers tonight might join us on other occasions. Um, one of the things that we do want to speak about is the, um, the, the, the threat to human rights uh, defenders, to lawyers and journalists in, in Belarus. Um, and the fact that, you know, I mean, they do not have an independent judiciary. The judiciary is just, uh, you know, um, totally captured by, the, uh, by, the, by Lukashenko and, uh, and his cronies. And so the, 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 uh, the system is, is not um, conforming to due process or anything like that. Um, and so we thought that we might, um, on the next occasion, have some discussion about um, the ways in which um, events have been covered and, uh, and so on. Um, how do people feel about that? Uh, um, I think it would be a really useful thing to do. Um, and of course, I say to all of our friends who took part tonight, um, it would be wonderful too if you could join us. But let me, let me say, this was a really interesting webinar. Um, we had the most distinguished crowd of uh, speakers. It was just marvelous. And I want to thank each and every one of you, Max, Nick, uh, Constantin, and of course, uh, Natalia is not here, Francois, Katia, and my friend, Jonathan Cooper, who's always the energy behind these events, and Raimonda, who helped put it all together. Can mm -hmm. I just thank you? I thought it was a really terrific um, uh, set of presentations and the exchanges were really excellent. Uh, thank you. What's happening in Belarus should be of concern to all of us um, who are involved in law, but who are involved in the concerns with human rights, with democracy, uh, with self-determination. Uh, so thank you very much indeed, all of you, for a very good event.